we're gonna answer the question, do I have to have sex with my potential spouse before we get married so I can know if the sex is good or not, if we connect sexually or not? I've gotta test drive the vehicle before I buy it. You're now listening to the No Pills Podcast, your best resource for cultivating meaningful, healthy, long-lasting, romantic relationships that bloom into strong marriages. Welcome to No Pills. Welcome to No Pills. (laughs) Love fully scripted. We back. You're back. I'm back. Your man. God's man. G-man. Brother Gordon. Let's get it, friends. I am your host, your guide through love, its ups, its downs, the turbulent seas and airs of relationship matters, because we know relationships matter. And today, we're going to answer the question, do I have to have sex with my potential spouse before we get married so I can know if the sex is good or not, if we connect sexually or not? Have you heard this? Male and female alike, I've got to test drive the vehicle before I buy it. Funny that the world uses that analogy because over here at No Pills, we have an analogy of a similar fashion. That being your love life, your relationships are the vehicle and you need to follow the owner's manual. God is the manufacturer, the Bible is the owner's manual and you need to follow that to its to the T to the letter so that your relationships your love life can function at peak performance friends do you have to test drive the vehicle before you buy it do you have to sleep with someone before you marry them to ensure that you're going to have good sex is the question we're going to tackle today and for all the folks that are not single I've got something for you too if you've been married for a long time and you've lost some of that passion stick around to the end of this podcast I, I haven't forgotten about all my married people all right I think the top two concerns that I hear in in this regard normally is one what if the motion in the ocean is not going to be right it's just not going to be good which you've already stated and two what if it's too short i need to know how how long the penis is before i just go all and go and marry somebody i'm just giving you real feedback friends this is what's really going on in people's minds so let me ask you to ask yourself a question if you believe you need to have sex with your potential spouse your fiance before you get married why do you think that? Where is that coming from? I want to submit to you, you are being hit with the comparison dilemma. Mm-hmm. The problem of comparison. This is a fornicator's fear. Now, I was once upon a time a fornicator myself. I was having sex before marriage, believe it or not. Yes, yes, it is true. It is true. And when you are a fornicator, when you're having sex before marriage and you've had multiple sex with multiple people, you now have this fear of comparison. In other words, you've it's anecdotal. You've had good sexual encounters and maybe you've had not so good sexual encounters. And now you're looking square in the face at this fear of like, what if we get married and the sex is terrible? Now, listen, this is not a virgin's fear. <laughs> someone who kept themselves holy, someone who refused Uh, to sleep with anybody other than their spouse, they don't have this fear. They may have the fear of having sex for the first time, but rarely are they concerned or if at all concerned about it not being pleasurable. Now, the other thing that could happen if you are not faced with the comparison dilemma is that someone else has come along, someone in your friend group, in your friend circle, has come and put fear in you that, hey, you, 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 you have to have sex with this person before you get married because the sex may be terrible. Now, this is probably generally coming from a fornicator, someone who's had multiple partners, and they believe they're trying to help you out with this terrible, terrible, terrible advice, okay? Don't listen to those individuals, okay? Don't do it. This is a misconception from the land of lies, okay? You want to just deal with facts, and a little bit of research, you know, because this is built upon the 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 fornicator's perspective, um, it's rooted, it's rooted in multiple experiences. But what is the actual facts of the matter? Well, over at the NIH, uh, there is a paper entitled "Female Sexual Arousal, Genital Anatomy, and Orgasm in Intercourse." This is by Kim Wallen, Ph.D., and Elizabeth A. Lloyd, Ph.D. 
And quoting, they say, although approximately 90% of women report orgasm from some form of sexual stimulation, most women do not routinely and some never experience orgasm solely from sexual intercourse. Get that. So here we are unnecessarily uh, worried about penis size when some women don't even experience orgasm, all right, through vaginal intercourse. So here you are getting yourself all worried, troubled, anxiety, fear, uh, leading yourself down the path of fornication. And here's the problem, friends. We have to learn how to trust God. Because of this unwarranted fear, you're now being convinced to break the commandments of God, the law of God, which are in place to protect your heart, to protect you, to protect mind, body, and soul. So this moral law that you're willing to forsake is going to open you up to more trauma, more hurt, and more pain. So when you're just thinking about your flesh, when you're just in your flesh and you're not walking in the spirit, when you're not walking in morality, in purity, in truth, now you're, you know, you're left with lies and misconceptions and hurt and harm. You don't want to be out here just pair bonding with every Tom, Dick, and Harry. You want to do it God's way. You want to do it per the owner's manual so you can have the best, best outcomes. So from a factual standpoint, okay, if you're ignoring the moral standpoint, if you're if you're ignoring the moral counsel and commandments of God that you should not have sex outside of marriage, then just know that most women or a good portion of women, I should say, pardon me, don't even achieve orgasm through vaginal penetration. Over at Medical News Today, I'm hitting you with some more facts today, friends. I want to hit you with facts. Vaginal death. Researchers found vaginal depth range from approximately two to five inches. The average vaginal depth was around 3.6 inches. Now, how, what do you think the average penis size is? This just blows my mind. So, average vaginal depth, 3.6 inches. Average penis size is five to seven inches. Sounds like the creator knows what he's doing. Sounds like he's taken the measurements needed and equipped everyone accordingly to successfully be able to procreate and to please one another. What do you say, friends? That's not coincidence. That's not accident. That is design. 3.6 depth, five to, six, 5 to 7 inches, okay? And I think the average penis size, so we can be clear, the average, like, average, average is probably, like, I think, 5.5 .5 or something like that. 5.2, some, some, somewhere around there, okay? Sexologist and sex and relationship coach, uh, Carrie O'Neill, PhD, said this. Many of the nerve endings in the vagina are located within the first third of the vagina's anterior or front wall, which includes the entryway. So that means most of the nerves are 1.6 inches into the vagina on average. And the average penis size is about five inches. What are you concerned about? Who has you all nervous, worried that it's not going to go well, that it's unachievable? It's almost coming from a place, you know, this type of statement is coming from a place of ignorance. Maybe even on the part of males and females not knowing their own bodies, not knowing how to actually connect, not understanding what love really is and what intimacy really is. I know, what a strange idea in this world of pornography. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Vaginal depth is unlikely to determine sexual satisfaction. Vaginal depth is unlikely to determine sexual satisfaction. Now you're saying, Brother Gordon, you're a man, okay? Don't you be telling me about my vagina, okay? Don't you be telling me about my preferences and all that. Ha ha. For those of you, ladies, who are thinking that, saying that, I hear you. I hear your thoughts. So I did some more research. And we got some female feedback on preference when it comes to penis size. 160 women who experience vaginal-only orgasms and had enough sexual partners to compare size experiences, 
60% of that group said size made no difference. And 6.3% said longer was less pleasurable than shorter. Ha! There it is. Out of the horse's mouth, friends. That's 160 females interviewed who, who were fornicators, who slept around, broke the law of God, giving us honest feedback. Beloved, do not fall into this trap of someone telling you or having this fear that, oh, I need to have multiple partners before I actually get married so that I could be better at sex. I can not I'll be terrible the night of I'm losing my virginity. Don't. Don't believe that lie. Don't fall into that lie. I'm giving you the facts. I'm giving you real feedback from real people. Trust the owner's manual. Trust the owner's manual. God knows what he's doing to protect your body and your heart and your love life. He knows what he's doing, friends. Don't have sex outside of marriage. Let's, let's go. Oh, yes, the dreaded Brother Gordon. But there's, but there's micro penises out there. There's micro penises, Brother Gordon. Do you know that there are micro penises, Brother Gordon? All right. All right, ladies. Men, it is rare. It's rare. 0.6% of people worldwide have a micro penis. 0.6% of people worldwide. In the United States, approximately 1.5 in 10,000 newborns are born with micro penises. But don't, don't forget, remember, that we just learned together that most women do not routinely and some never experience orgasm solely through sexual vaginal intercourse anyhow. So don't be tripping over micro penises. I know this is the elephant in the room, so to say, the penis size. Okay, but we've got feedback. Too big is not too good. We have no research to say that too short won't work. And even those who are having, even females that are having regular routine sex with an average size man with an average size penis are not having orgasm through vaginal intercourse. So what, what, are we, what, are we, what are we concerned about? What are we all worked up about? What is our fear about? This is for all my virgins, all my born again virgins out there, everybody trying to do it right. Trust God. Trust the plan, friends. All right, listen, I was married for almost 18 years, together with my spouse almost 20 years before she passed away of cancer, um, going on three years now. So I'm not speaking on something that I have no experience in. I was a fornicator and I was married for a very, a very long time, in my opinion, okay? So there's a few things I want to say to you. You will learn how to please one another in the bedroom. This is coming from personal experience. If you're willing, if you're willing to learn, you will learn how to please your spouse in the bedroom within the confines of your marriage. All right. That's the first thing I want to share with you. And I'm saying that from personal experience. Second thing, marriage consists of a lot more than having pleasurable sex. So if your reason for getting married is to have sex, to have pleasurable sex, don't do it. You're not ready. You're not ready. You are not ready. Next point I want to give you. If you're getting married just for selfish reasons, in other words, it's all about you. You're getting married just for you, just because you want the nice wedding. You want the ice sculpted swan. You want the destination wedding. You, 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 me, me, I, I. You're not ready. You're not ready for marriage, friends. Marriage is an institution that God gave us in perfection that was designed to be a reflection of him. And in our time and day and age, it is to be an institution where God can use to bring more souls into eternity, uh, to raise godly children, uh, to execute and experience love, amen, in a safe environment. If you're not ready for that, if that's not how you understand marriage to be, then don't go break somebody else's heart. Don't, don't go do that to somebody. You're not ready, friends. You're not ready. And I'm saying this from a place of personal experience having been married. And uh, we're going to do another podcast soon 
where I'm going to talk about uh, you know, how you how you can ruin your marriage. Now, for those of you who are married and the passion has dwindled out, Gottman.com, there are 10 ways we're going to cover right now to rekindle the passion in your marriage. Now, if you're not married yet, you want to pay attention as well because you want to put these in the place so that your fire doesn't go out in your marriage. All right. One, change your pattern of initiating sex. Now, sometimes what will happen is we'll start to deny one another uh, of sexual intercourse, of sexual intimacy. We'll deny with one another. Or maybe sometimes we'll come on too strong or not strong enough. All that can create, you know, bad um, patterns, bad responses. And then it's like, oh, man, this is always we can never get started correctly. So be willing to change your patterns of initiating sexual intercourse. Communication is key, right? Like, hey, I don't that doesn't really do it for me when we approach me this way and vice versa. And no, and, and no need to uh, point fingers or blame you, you want to just be able to connect. And to help with that, to help with that, hold hands often. Next point. Next tip. Tip number two, hold hands often. Something this simple, friends, you overlook. You know, it's funny. When you're dating and courting, when you're courting, I should say, when you're courting your spouse, you, you can't get enough of them. Uh, maybe that's all you can think about is holding your hands or if you were doing it the unsafe way you were holding hands all the time and say, Brother Gordon, what do you mean the unsafe way? Let me read you something. Dr. Corey Floyd said, holding hands, hugging and touching can release oxytocin, tocin, causing a calming sensation. That's just from hugging and holding hands. Sounds like some level of pair bonding is happening there. Just from holding hands. Listen, this is why I covered it in another, in another episode about what? Hey, man, keep your hands off a woman or a, or a man that is not your husband. Don't do it. Holding hands and hugging and touching can release oxytocin, causing a calming sensation. Studies show it's also released during sexual orgasm. Additionally, physical affection reduces stress hormones, lowering daily levels of the stress hormone cortisol. Listen, friends, hold hands more. Amen. If you're married, if you're married, if you're not married, keep your hands to yourself. Number three, allow there to be some tension build up, some anticipation, moderation. You don't have to have sex every day, all the day, all the time. Like just by by you, by you let, letting let, letting the tension build, the brain experiences more pleasure when the anticipation of the reward goes on for some time before you receive it. Number four, separate sexual intimacy from your daily routine, the daily routine of life. What am I saying? What are we saying? What, 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 is, this, what is this point bringing out? Plan the intimacy, right? And we say, well, brother, that doesn't sound, I want to be spontaneous. I want some spontaneity. I want to just, no, all right, but if you've got kids, if you're married, you got 40 hour work week jobs, you got a real life you live in. You need to plan it so you're not talking about relationship problems. You're not talking about household chores. You're not talking about everything else that's going on outside the bedroom, planning it, and also setting parameters and guardrails to say, hey, this is our time now to be intimate. This is our time now to come together. We're not going to let anything come in and disturb this time that we have together. Listen, bringing drama into your bedroom and stress will have the sexual arousal just nosedive into the ground. You won't even get off the ground half the times. <laughs> All right. Number five, uh, carve out time to spend with your partner. All right. This is important. You know, if you're warm to your wife during the day, she'll be warm to you during the night. Let the courting and the flirt flirting, excuse me, continue on in the marriage. Mm hmm. Yeah. Enjoy one another's company. Enjoy giving each other the googly eyes. Dr. Gottman says that everything positive you do in your relationship is foreplay. So that means every positive interaction you and your spouse have is foreplay. So just think about the inverse being true. Every negative, negative interaction you have 
with your spouse is killing the foreplay. So arguing, bickering, just killing, killing your intimacy, killing what's going to happen or could take place in the bedroom. So you got to get upstream. You've got to get upstream, right? You got to say, okay, wait, 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 wait. We, we need to be, I need to be flirting with you. I need to be all over you. I need to be, you know, walking around wanting to smell you the way it used to be. Come on, married folks. All right, number six, focus on affectionate touch. So it's not any type of touch, but affectionate touch. Back rubs, shoulder rubs, maybe you're rubbing feet, massaging. But there's affection, intention behind the touch. Releasing stress, okay? This is all going to help rekindle and stimulate the passion that has maybe gone away or that has been hidden has been bogged down, has been covered by life's stresses, uh, which is so easy to have happen. Number seven, practice being more emotionally vulnerable during sex. To me, practically, that looks like speak up, say what you like, say what you enjoy, be vulnerable. That I think many individuals may be in marriages where they're not connecting the way God intended for them to connect intimately, sexually, in the bedroom um, because there's a taboo still. There's so much fear about what they enjoy and what they don't enjoy. So be emotionally vulnerable during sex. Number eight, maintain a sense of curiosity about sexual intimacy. Keep learning each other. <laughs> Keep learning each other. Let, let, let there be some curiosity. You know, I, um, I, I've said this before, like, you know, you're... you're your, your spouse is a, uh, a class that you never graduate from, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, sexually. Number nine, break the sexual intimacy routine if you have fallen into one. Mm. Look at sex as an opportunity to get to know your partner better over time. Sometimes, you know, we get into routines and we're going to just do it the way we've been doing it for the last 10 years. Same place, same location, same. Like we're gonna just keep every, like everything just the same. We got just we fall into routines, you know. Especially when there's children involved and there's 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 after school programs and everything else, and you just get into these little weird patterns. I know if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if it's if it's if you're losing the intimacy, if you're losing the connectivity, just do a double check and say, hey man, if we fall into some, into some patterns that are just not fruitful uh, to being passionate in the bedroom. Number 10, last tip, experiment with new ways to bring pleasure to each other within, within, the, within the confines of uh, maintaining respect and love for one another. Be erotic. You know, we, we spoke about uh, the Songs of Solomon. Go read the Songs of Solomon together, friends. If you're married, read the Songs of Solomon together, you know, and let God pour into you uh, that intimacy and that passion uh, that I, I believe he intends for the married couples, the married individuals to have. Hold on, I think I might have been off one. No, number 10 now, number 10 now. That was number nine. Uh, last one, make sex a priority. Now, this is a good one, all right? Get off the phones. Get off the phones, get off the devices, get off the social media. You may not be able to connect because you're on the video games. You're on the, there's so much distraction today, friends. Eat you a light meal in the evening and come together, undivided, uninterrupted time together in the bedroom. You know, give each other your eyes. Give each other your time, you know, and connect. All right, friends, what have we learned today? What have we learned today? You do not, okay? Biblically speaking, scientifically speaking, physically speaking, you do not need to, should not have sex before you are married with the person you're engaged to. You do not have to have sex with them beforehand in order to guarantee you're going to have good sex. You're going to learn each other. All the time that the Lord will give us, we'll, you'll, be, you'll figure it out. You'll, you'll figure it out. All right. Um. If a woman desires to have an orgasm, the mind should be as much in sync as the female genitalia or even the male genitalia. It's in the mind, friends. It's in the mind. Maybe the focus should be more on the partner than the penis. 
Maybe the focus should be more on the emotion than the motion in the ocean. I'm Gordon McGee. This is No Pills, Love Fully Scripted, and I'm signing off, and I'll catch you next week.